Ladies and gentlemen, it is now my pleasure to announce the very, very last plenary speaker of this ninth European Pain Congress here in Vienna. Professor Chris Wissers is anesthesiologist. He is professor in pain and in palliative medicine and chairman of the academic center of pain and pain medicine at the Radboud University Nijmegen Medical Center. Besides that, just recently, I think, he became also the chairman of the ESMO dedicated Center for Integrated Oncology and Palliative Care. And I think that means something, quite something, for an anesthesiologist to chair such an integrated oncology unit. I enjoyed very much to collaborate with him during the last years. We know each other for many years already. I enjoyed to collaborate with him as a friend, to collaborate on common publications, and also to work closely with him during his active, very active time as the chairman of our EFIC committee on education. He had to reduce a little bit then his activities within EFIC, and the reason is of course known to you. He is now the president of the World Institute of Pain, the WIP, and is now again very actively working there. His main research interests, and he has, he has many interests in research, are first of all neuropathic pain, the translational approach and also the translational research on neuropathic pain. The second focus is on quality indicators, and I think that is an important part of his work, quality indicators in pain, in pain treatment, and in palliative medicine. And last but not least, he is also very much interested in improving education, education in pain management, education in palliative care. And this is, of course, also reflected in the talk he is going to give us today. So it is the connection between theory and practice, not only talking, about the topic, but also influencing the whole development for a really fruitful future. So I'm sure you are going to experience now an exciting plenary lecture, and I'm pleased to ask Chris now to come up to the podium and to give this lecture. Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear chairman, dear organizers of the EFIC meeting here in a marvelous place in Vienna, dear colleagues, dear friends, uh, I'm very proud here to stand because I think that translating evidence of making evidence, that's very hard for all of us, and that's our main topic that we should look at. Secondly, I'm so proud to speak after Vanya Napkarian, who teached us that the brain is a dynamic process and this dynamic process is part of my team, is part of my hospital, is part of my country now, and we all try to prove these dynamic processes in clinical practice. And that's a long way to go. I'm coming from Nijmegen, I'm working in Nijmegen as a Belgian. It is a very northern part of the old Roman Empire, and we have a 1,000 bed academic center with a marvelous outside pain consultation on a hill in the forests, very attractive for people. And I think that is important to know that people should have a good place to go and to see their doctor, their treater. Cancer pain, new paradigms. That's a very difficult topic because 
I was present on the first meeting of EFIC in Verona, and I was a trainee, and I was listening to all of my teachers present here in the room, and I was listening how can we improve care. They learned me, and a lot of my, my presentation is in honor of their work previously before me. These giants guide me. Pain is one of the most common and prominent sim symptoms in chronic pain. Uh, in, in oncological states is present at the diagnosis in 30 to 40 percent of the cases, in 40 to 70 percent during the um, during the treatment, and at end of life, 70 to 90 percent of our cases should have or will have some form of pain. And additionally, a forgotten group were the cancer survivors. They were not looked at at all. So this group is a new one. In total, we have every year 40 million cases, new cases for cancer. More survivors because there is an early diagnosis and better cancer treatment. And most survivors also experience negative physical and psychological problems. Pain, and particularly neuropathic pain, is prevalent and influences the quality of cancer, uh, quality of life of our cancer patients and survivors. It's a very disabling problem. It's a costly problem, and it is difficult to manage. Sam Ahmed Sain from Sheffield made a nice presentation you see here. We do have people who are involved in the remission of cancer. Some of them are relapsing, some of them are survivors, more and more. But it's hard to know for a pain clinician, for all of you, where your patient is going, because our biomarkers in cancer are not that strong yet and we can divide several kinds of patients in pain. We do have pain patients due to the treatments, yeah, oncological treatment, procedural treatment, postoperative treatment. We have unrelated pains. We do have metastatic disease pain, which is difficult to treat, and end of life, and don't forget the survivors. So looking to all of these and having only one algorithm that we adapted several years ago to WHO ladder and applicated in all the different levels of these patients, that's a hard way to go and it's very insufficient for the future. So what are we doing then today? A very nice publication in pain from Marike van der Beuken showed us that depending on the stage of your disease in cancer, you have a different prevalence of pain and also a difference in the se severity of your pain state. And I think this is an important issue to try to give as a definition for each patient you are observing. And even one step further, as one of the first publications she mentioned, that depending on the state of the disease, but also of the type of the cancer, you can have different pain behaviors. And we are not fully sure if pain in an oncological state from the abdomen is different from, from a brain tumor. I'm sure it will, but we have no data. So this was the first indication measured by the brief pain inventory. And one step further, she proved that our treatment for pain in these patients, measured by a pain management index, in general, 50% of our patients are not treated properly, and we don't give attention to them, even at the end of life situation. So people do suffer. And I support them very strongly the the message of EFIC, don't suffer in silence. So that's why we are working here. And she made even one step further some predictors, some indicators we should take care of when we see our patients. A very strong one was the disease group. So patients in an active therapy for oncological state are very prone to have pain from this disease. So this is a group you are not looking at. You are waiting for the referral of a patient to your department, to your pain practice. And as we know from Breivik previously, only 4% of cases are referred to your practice. The second one is the educational level of the patient. A lower educational level is a risk factor of having chronic pain. So it's quite easy to make a program for that. So what are we doing today? What is the today's outcome of all this? And we try to measure that. We try to measure it in our department and by the several kinds of study I will present here for you. First of all, pain is not systematically registered 
in Dutch medical oncology outpatients. There are some papers coming out this year stating the same from Toronto and from the MD Anderson, so we are very happy that we all have the same problem. There were no recent publications at the time of this publication, and we did a study in six hospitals around our academic center in the outpatient oncological departments. We were exploring the medical records and we were looking for formulations quantitatively uh, for pain scores, but also qualitatively for a description on any word which can refer to pain yeah? and non-specific symptom description. The results were surprising. A total of 987 visits were collected and only in 229 visits pain was registered in any word in the oncological department. The quantitative registration was only done once in all these patients. So these are not numbers to be proud of. We went one step further. There was a variation in the departments, as you can see here, that depending on the hospital, we have different outcomes in wording about pain and measuring about pain. And even worse, becoming a normal contact twice, thrice, in your relationship with the medical oncologist made a decrease, a significant decrease in this wording. So they don't talk about pain during the practice. And that's also what we observe. Important is to know that patients themselves are reluctant to speak about pain because they are in fear that the medical oncologist will stop having attention for the life prolonging activities and treatments. And therefore, this can be a conflicting problem. So our conclusions of these studies were pain is not registered in medical records of oncology outpatients. One of four visits was pain or its absence was registered only by wording and pain scores with a validated pain score were absent. There was no improvement over the last 10 years unless the introduction of a national guideline on cancer care in 2008 for the Netherlands on the diagnosis and treatment of pain in cancer patients. So, we concluded that the, we have to implement a standard screening, VAS or NRS, for each patient contact. And secondly, we should use pain-specific questions because patients are reluctant reporting on pain during their consultation. This was an important conclusion. We went one step further. In the same departments, we were measuring what is the pain prevalence in these departments and what is the influence of this with the interference of their daily activities. It was also surprising for us because the more pain you have, the more interference. And if you look to the people with severe pain, a pain scale from 7, 8, 9 or 10, it's dramatically how their life is influenced and they are living daily in our hospitals and our medical practices, outpatient department. So this was also important to look and to see what we can do. And surprisingly, the treatment in often of in most of the cases was absent. This was an evaluation for pharmacological treatment, but as you can see, there is an increase in the prescription of opioids, but it's far below the basic level we expect from uh, our measurements in these populations. So we have a long way to go. Conclusions were a total of 428 patients participated in this study. 39% of, of patients reported pain, 20% reported moderate to severe pain, a pain scale above 5. Of those patients with pain, analgesic treatment was in inadequate in 62%. And having a high pain intensity is a risk factor of having pain-related interference with your daily activities. Also important to look at and to be aware of. So the last study we performed in these uh, practices was a prevalence study on neuropathic pain, and that was a cross-sectional study in 800, 902 cases. Pain was identified by scoring of its intensity, quality, and interference with daily activities by the BPE. Neuropathic symptoms were identified by the DN4, and pain characteristics were looked up by McGill questionnaire. And what we see here, what you can observe, is that the risk factors, again, the predictors of having acute and high pain was having a severe pain, firstly, being in the active disease group, a group you don't observe normally, having neurotoxic drugs like cytostatics, yeah, and having an operation 
in the period before the patient was observed. So these points are important to look at. Of these patients, we had a very good response rate. 22% reported moderate to severe pain in the past 24 hours. Women, patients with breast or lung cancer or receiving radiotherapy report significant more pain. 90% scored positive on neuropathic symptoms. 40% of the patients with moderate to severe pain also have neuropathic symptoms causing increased interference with daily activities. And there is a need to improve the screening and diagnosis on chronic neuropathic pain in cancer patients. So how can we improve then? That's our next step. What should you do in your clinical practice? And I was surprised because this surgeon from Mass Gen Hospital in Boston stated in 1917, I'm called eccentric for saying in public that hospitals, if they wish to be sure of improvement, must find out what their results are, must analyze their results to find their strong and weak points, must compare the results with those of other hospitals. Such opinions will not be eccentric a few days later, from hence, 100 years ago. And the common sense notion is that every hospital should follow every patient it treats long enough to determine whether or not the treatment has been successful, and then to inquire, if not, why not, with a view to preventing similar failures in the future. We are 100 years later of Tottenham. can be a very good topic for a future Congress. Where are we? Where are you in your clinical practice in doing and measuring this for all your patients? So we, we analyzed this uh, impact, for example, because we are making national guidelines, we are making international guidelines, um, and these guidelines should impact our uh, daily practice, and we measure that. But it's not true. Yeah? Therefore, we make some proposals, because guidelines are not implemented at all. First of all, dedicated nurses should assess pain systematically at all cases, at all contexts. Patient empowerment should have an important role because the patient can help us strongly in improve their pain. And finally, patients should use a pain diary. We have several examples and EFIC is collaborating on these pro uh, proposals. But that's not enough. The American Society of Clinical Oncology, which is the equivalent of the ESMO here in Europe, made a special structure, made a special quality improvement program, an assessment and improvement program for all US-based outpatient hematology and oncology practices to create a culture of self-examination for the medical doctor, in this case the oncologist. And what they do is they have national data and when you have a Medicare patient, you have to complete your questionnaire monthly and you are compared against a certain level, which is the level of the whole USA. And what you can see here, and read with me, is that indicators on oncological care are quite okay. They are scoring above normal. But the indicators in our business, in it, where we are interested in, are scoring under. First of all, for pain. Secondly, for correct referrals to hospice care, for example, that's strongly below the normal behavior and the mean. And that's important to look at. So you can learn as an individual medical oncologist where you are on this scale and if you are doing well compared to others. I'm fully aware that all these questionnaires is a lot of work. But if this improves our care, I think it can be worthwhile to study how to do it. They went one step further because we all know when you speak about pain, it's not, not all about pain. Your definitions are not clear. So they make a list of definitions and they use this list uh, very strictly during the scoring system. And is this worthwhile to go? Yes. The group of Tamel of Vicky Jackson from Masjen Hospital did a study for palliative care, uh, just an example, in the most bad tumor you can have in your life, non-small cell carcinoma. And this study was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. It was accompanied by an editorial of Diane Meyer from New York stating that we should walk the way of a patient together. Medical oncologist, uh, pain specialist, anesthesiologist, any person who is taking care of the patient and that we have better outcome. And the proof of the outcome is this study because they randomized people. One group was giving only normal oncological treatment the second group was giving, the B group, was giving oncological treatment with an additional palliative care program given by a good team. And you see here dramatic change 
in the depressive scales and also in the overall functioning of patients 13 weeks after the initiation of this protocol. But most surprising was a dramatic difference in the survival rate of the people during the study period on 13 weeks. And this was very convincing for the future. So what should you do in your practice? I think we are at this moment at the end of life referrals, mostly. We should move dramatically forward and work together with the oncologist in your hospital for screening, for evaluation, for helping patients in their self-empowerment and to introduce telemedicine techniques that can help patients to communicate with our nurses, with our departments for follow-up and see for those patients who are at risk that there is a ringing bell going on. These are important uh, uh, activities for the future. But what are our limitators and facilitators in this program? And we do have several. We did a very good study together with Hans Kress, referring to and the EFIC and with the president of the EASP, uh, to see how many guidelines do we have in Europe. We have 34 countries, we have 58 national guidelines, if you can understand, I can't. And we evaluated what was the quality of these guidelines and following the agreed to methodology. Only nine of these guidelines have a basic level of quality. It's even worse because we have the same selection of literature with different outcomes and different evidence levels. So that was not acceptable for the future. And our conclusion from this study is that there should be more international collaboration needed to improve the quality of our guidelines. Secondly, it was a huge amount of money used for these guidelines and having only two guidelines are coming out, we have more than enough budget in our own pocket to improve practice for the future. There were also patient-related factors. A lot of publications are supporting that. Some are hypothesizing from non-cancer pain, but for cancer pain we know that your gender, your age, your body mass index, your activity level, that your socioeconomic state are all risk factors to have chronic pain. So we should implement this knowledge in our program. And finally, this is a very surprising study done by a patient organization between their members, 7,000 members. They were looking from how large is the risk for suicide in patients with prostatic cancer. And surprisingly, you see that their indicators were low self-rated quality of life, we can influence, the experience of physical pain, pain during mixing, and low rated mental and physical energy. They didn't mention at all sexual function. So I think this is an important conclusion we are responsible for to take care for the future. And how can we manage that? What is a facilitator? One of these facilitators is the patient empowerment program where the doctor, the medical professional, is teaching the patient and enforcing on his activities, making a shared decision model, and from there going to a patient who can take his own decisions on its own problems and needs and on his own force. But where is the force coming from? So can we detect for the future our innovators? Yes, we can. I think that you, that all of us, should do also personalized medicine like the medical oncologist. It's not about receptors, it's not about biopsies and goats and antibodies, but it's about a causal situation which is going to the genetic factors and the influencing factors, the contributing factors, the environmental, as we heard from the previous speakers. We do have a phenotype of pain, which is very individual, which you can't put together in evidence-based medicine. We should adapt to a specific, individualized, multidimensional pain program, and we should monitor, monitor that program globally Europe, in Europe, global in the world, for making good diagnostic tests to see what happens on all these levels. And we should connect daily these data with the outcome and with our observations. That was what one day in 1977 Engel wrote down yeah, uh, in Nature. So that was important. Ronald Melzack made a very nice adaptation of the John Loser model, which is presented several times during this Congress. And I like it because we have an input side at the left side for you with the cognitive brain sites, we have the sensory conduction system and emotional systems, and we heard from Vanyan that emotion is important. Yeah, we have a big black box for us as clinicians, not for Vanyan, but for me. 
yeah? And it's coming out a pain perception, you feel something, you have an action program, you don't do anything anymore when you have chronic pain, and you have a stress-relating pro program because you become depressed. I think we try to help that as clinicians by non-pharmacological, pharmacological interventions, by uh, cognitive behavioral treatment of any program and kind with rehabilitation, and more and more for Europe with mindfulness. Very attractive. But I think we should go to control the black box one step further. We should introduce from now a biopsychosocial, spiritual, eventual economic yeah, model and program for the future. Influence it at all levels together, the three levels of our program, but also influencing our black box. Because we really think that it matters. And if you give your attention, spiritual, existential attention to your patient, all professionals know that they influence their patient and they're happy to see you. So the previous speaker was demonstrating that by the empathy. We wrote down this statement in a paper, is there a need for including spiritual care in an interdisciplinary rehabilitation program for chronic pain patients? Yes, we think. I think it's an innovative strategy. And what are we doing? We are offering to people a 16-week week program where we are detecting, we are following several points. Is the patient participating in the society on any level, not only work-related? What is his symptom level and what is the activity level? And we are looking week by week what are the aversive stimuli, what are the interventions we offer and what is the uh, outcome of these interventions, what are positive reinforcers and how can we make them stronger, what are natural reinforcers, so your behavior, and what are negative reinforcers, so you have to avoid them. And this program is, I think, very uh, successful. People are very happy to participate because they have the feeling of an integrated uh, attention, including the spiritual care in this program, and the data will come out soon of this program. We already tested in a small group of these advanced care patients by a, sp a specific physical training uh, program, the feasibility of this training program. And be aware that these patients were, long, were only having still three to two months living of survival. And even in these patients, we have a dramatic improvement of their physical condition, of their behavior, of their body mass index, and their, consum their consumption of drugs and analgesic was less. So this is important to look for the future at. Finally, I think that we, as pain specialists, should implement the whole program. We know a lot about non-pharmacological and pharmacological treatment, but there is a step four in the WHO ladder, and that's the early initiation of interventional techniques at the proper way. We started with a small case of one of the attendees here, so for recurrent vulvar carcinoma. It's a very dramatic tumor for women, and it's hard to deal at home because you can't treat it people because of open wounds. We started a preventive program, placing intrathecal catheters with external pumps, and our observations were dramatic and important. First of all, we had an optimal pain control, hence people can go home, and it was easy to deal with the tumor and to take care of them. But the clinical observation was that we had spontaneous wound repair, and we had a delayed metastasis in these patients. Yeah, and we are preparing this for a publication also, because I think we should be aware that giving good pain treatment can be also a disease-modifying activity for the future, and we should study that. That is the new paradigm. We are a member of the treatment team of an oncological patient. So, what can I give as conclusions of my lecture? First of all, cancer pain is highly prevalent among patients, and it's everywhere. Patients don't report spontaneously. You should make a program to evaluate them at all places they come. Thirdly, medical specialists of any kind don't explore cancer pain. So, cancer pain is not ju just cancer pain, but patients need a very personalized cancer pain management program, included an adapted rehabilitation program. Don't put them on a chair. Chronic cancer pain has four dimensions, including the spiritual or existential dimension. An early initiation of a cancer management program improves the general outcome of cancer worldwide. So we are, in, 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 we are invited to participate in that program. I can give you some recommendations for your own practice. 
introduce a multidimensional diagnosis and treatment program for cancer pain, including interventional treatments at your practice. Standardize, register and deliver accreditation to best practices worldwide. Install a follow-up program to improve and to measure outcome. Introduce a special education and training program, a teacher-teacher program for professionals. Introduce a personalized and self-management program for patients and be member of the team to educate and improve your data banking and ICT monitoring so that Hans and myself, EFIC and all other societies can do nice clinical studies for the future, Hans. I cannot stand here without my team. They give me time to be here, they give me time to give this message to the world and I'm very grateful to each of them that they are willing to participate in this mission. And forgive me for this last slide, I will really invite you to all to our World Congress in New York of the WIP. It's a clinical congress, so it's less basic science, but there is basic science, and we are happy that Clifford Wolf approved our program. Thank you for your attention. So thank you, Chris, for this excellent lecture, giving us not only a clear analysis of the situation, but also showing us the challenges and, in addition, giving us suggestions where we should go in the future in the treatment of cancer pain patients. I think this was a very proper closing of our series of uh, plenary lectures during this ninth congress here in Vienna and of course also our last plenary speaker will receive this memorial plaque that should remind you of the lecture given on the occasion of this congress here in Vienna. So thank you. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the end of our uh, plenary session, but of course we have not reached the end of the whole Congress. I would like first of all to thank now in this moment the chair of our scientific program committee already because the scientific program committee and Chris Eccleston, who was the chair and is still the chair of this, com chair of this committee, they are responsible also for these excellent plenary lectures that we have uh, enjoyed and that we have heard during the last days and today. I would also like to congratulate already now the president of this ninth Congress and of the European Pain Federation EFIC, Chris Wells. I think this is and has been a very successful Congress here and I hope that you have got the same impression. The Congress still continues until this afternoon and I was asked by our president to remind you that we will have a um, closing ceremony and during this closing ceremony we will have some highlights. The first highlight of course will be that we will hand over the poster prizes, the poster awards to our winners. But please keep in mind and be aware only those groups that are at least represented by one member of the group, can also have the award. So you should, you should be present if you are among those that have been chosen for the poster prizes, and the poster prizes, as you know, are very attractive. Secondly, we will also give again travel grants and the winners of these travel grants, the so-called bursarists, it's an English term I didn't know before, so I have learned something today. The bursarists are also kindly invited to attend our closing ceremony this afternoon.
because otherwise you cannot get these travel grants. And last but not least, I am pleased to remind you that also our next Congress venue, Copenhagen in Denmark for 2017, will be presented and officially announced during this closing. It will be uh, Thomas Graven Nielsen and the other Thomas, Thomas Tölle, uh, who will give you just a teaser of what will happen 2017 in Copenhagen then, and that will be our 10th European Pain Congress organized by the European Pain Federation. So thank you, thank you all of you for coming also to this early plenary session, and I wish you a nice last day of our Congress and hopefully you have also an opportunity to stay over the weekend here in Vienna and I wish you of course also a safe, safe trip back home. Take care, bye bye.